So I'm giving you a light introduction, possibly inspiring. Uh, the material certainly inspired me, uh, and it relates almost entirely to John Desmond Bernal. And he was an Irishman, which is one reason for picking him. Uh, but also I see connections with my own contributions to our subject. His contribution was a definite point of inflection in the subject that we have come to Aberystwyth to think about, packing. It wasn't really unique. Indeed, others did similar things at the same time or even slightly before. But Bernal was a major figure. And that meant that his thoughts and actions in this were definitely influential in the research community. Let me say a bit more about his background, personality. Uh, he was, most importantly for us, he was, he was a major influence in research in England. He was one of the founders of modern biophysics as a subject and molecular biology, which grew out of it, uh, appropriately enough in Cambridge and then in Birkbeck. And he approached the subject uh, from the, the professional uh, standing of an expert X-ray crystallographer. So we can imagine there with Bragg and so on in Cambridge in the middle of the 20th century, that was an important uh, area to get excited about. Indeed, you could think of him as a predecessor of Watson and Crick. And I wonder about the psychological connections. Certainly Crick is quite complimentary to him in his autobiography. But he came too early to solve the really big problem that they unraveled. But there's a parallel. He did a lot of very distinguished work and it is often said that he narrowly missed the Nobel Prize. Uh, this included work on sex hormones. Uh, and that was appropriate enough because he was extraordinarily sexy himself. Uh, look in the book that Asti and I wrote on packing, if you want a clue about that. Uh, he described his family background out of which he sprang as that of a small farm or small farmer in the west of Ireland. And that's very misleading and probably insincere. At that time, early in the early middle 20th century, small farmers in Ireland were extraordinarily poor. They, they had, it was rare for them to cash in their pockets. It was a subsistence existence. His parents had a large farm and were wealthy enough to be able to send him to top schools in England, from which he progressed to Cambridge. He developed an antipathy to England, at least in relation to his own home country. And maybe that's what led him to be an ardent communist, which is one of the most extraordinary aspects of his life. He never renounced it. He believed totally in Marxist communism. Not so very unusual in those days. A parallel career is that of J.B.S. Haldane, another biologist, uh, biophysicist maybe. Um, and he also was a communist but not nearly so much as this dedicated Irishman who somehow substituted communism for Catholicism with which he'd grown up. Uh, as I said, he was somewhat anti-English and yet he had a very successful career in England and had a lot to be thankful for. I think England, for all its faults, the English academic world has always welcomed Mavericks 
from anywhere, uh, provided they had real talent in places like Cambridge. And I think that reflects well on it. Very late in his career, he didn't live to a great age, but towards the end of his career, he developed an interest in the structure of water. Maybe that's not so strange for a biologist or a biophysicist. And that generalized to liquids in general and then narrowed down. And as you know, X-ray diffraction gives rather limited information on the structure of a liquid. So you have to get into your office and scratch your head and try to decide how you're going to approach uh, model building in any sense. He developed what he called a new way of looking. He knew that he was trying to change people's minds about their subject. His mathematical credentials were good. He, he, he began his Cambridge career by uh, taking the mathematics degree. Indeed, as a student, he had written a large thesis on the applications of quaternions to crystallography. Why would he do that? Well, he came from the town of Nina in the west of Ireland, and William Rowan Hamilton had a close association with Nina. I'm sure that's the reason. But nevertheless, I mean, he, what he was renouncing in this work that I shall talk about was the strictly mathematical approach to the subject of liquids, uh, which has to do with correlation functions and approximation to the correlation functions and approximations to the approximation. I can recall not many years after this, this period, um, myself turning to that and buying a book and looking at it, I couldn't get anywhere with it. And I felt sorry for the people who, who, who buried their careers in that kind of mathematics for the problem of liquids. Uh, he recognized that this was a dead end. And he adopted a hands-on approach to model making. Now, maybe that's kind of obvious today, but it wasn't obvious then. Uh, the details of what he did, I'm not going to talk about. There's a very good review article by John Finney, who I think was his student. Yes, I think he was. Uh, Bernal's Road to Random Packing. And it's all there. Uh, and as I say, it, the approach was to, to use your hands to build models. And this isn't entirely original. People like Lord Kelvin love to do that kind of thing and exhibit the models in public. Uh, mainly for periodic crystal structures, of course. Nevertheless, as I said, uh, Bernal's contribution was seminal. And he started out with the great pronouncement of his belief that liquid structures were homogeneous, coherent, and essentially irregular assemblages of molecules containing no crystalline regions. Now, that might seem kind of obvious to you, but the great prejudice among many people, apart from those mathematicians, the more physically minded people tended to, to say a liquid has to, has to be a kind of a polycrystal. It's, it's rearranging itself all the time, but locally it's, it's crystalline. Uh, that's a very strong idea, conservative idea. It was then and a little later as well. No, he said, it's a random structure, as we would well accept today, and I'm going to study it with my hands. Bernal did live long enough just about to see the introduction of computers, which were adequate for scientific purposes. He did attempt a little bit of this with the help of his son, but he rapidly gave up. Uh, it's the same story for me as far as the smartphone is concerned. And so he resorted to, resorted to building models by hand. And when he packed together ball bearings, I'm sure you know a bit about this, packed together ball bearings and then dissected them and studied them and measured mechanically the, 
and optically their the positions of the balls and so on. Uh, he, he got a number of key results. Uh, the density, famous density, the Bernal density, the coordination of it, the number of average number of contacting balls per ball. Um, and, uh, and those were the two main numbers that still live in the literature. Uh, eventually, a radial distribution function of the kind that those mathematicians were so keen on. Now, for me, that's significant because just personally, it's significant because the, the correlation function, the, the radial the radial distribution function, you know, big peak for the nearest neighbors, and then it wiggles off to infinity. But the second peak, the broad peak that comes after the sharp nearest neighbor peak has some peculiar features, which are attributed to singularities due to the hardness of the spheres. And this was spotted at a crystallography conference or congress by a good friend of mine, Slade Cargo, another crystallographer, but one interested in crystallography of random systems, work, doing his PhD at Harvard. And he, at a crystallography congress, saw the radial distribution function for amorphous metals, not liquids, amorphous metals, and the, the, which were disordered solids. And there were these features that existed in the hard sphere random packing. And he made his early career out of that observation, his PhD and his career. This is despite the fact that amorphous metals are not uh, monatomic, they, they're compounds, but which clouds the issue a little bit, but nevertheless, the similarity was there. And one personal consequence of this, that I, being at Harvard at that time and participating in wonderful group discussions led by David Turnbull, a wonderful man, very, very quiet, almost shy, but kind to all his students, and even to postdocs, the nosy postdocs like me, and I, I owe him a great debt. Uh, and he was the supervisor of Cargo. And so it happened that, that I left Harvard and, and followed Cargo to Yale. Uh, he said, why don't you apply for the Gibbs instructorship? And I did, and I ended up there having more discussions on this subject with, with Cargo. Nevertheless, I really didn't contribute much to all this, uh, but it did cause me to spring into a, a different uh, avenue of research that's closely similar. Amorphous silicon, solid amorphous silicon, was all the rage. And uh, I was interested in its band, band structure and so on. And I find myself naturally, after the, the background I have just discussed, building ball and stick models of the random structure, the random network of amorphous silicon. And I was definitely in the lead. Of it. And this must have been inspired through cargo by Bernal. Again, history repeats itself. Most people, physicists, that is, who were interested in amorphous silicon said it has to be polycrystalline. Maybe heavily disguised, but it's crystalline. Exactly the wrong idea that people had had in liquids in previous decades. At Yale, there were several of us who you might call the young Turks, the young assistant professors. Uh, uh, and we, we uh, had a very bright idea. Uh, congratulate us in retrospect. We invented a scheme by which talented undergraduates could come to Yale for the summer and do research with us, with members of the department. It was a fantastic success. NSF funded it, huge success. We got the brightest students from every great university in the United States. Of course, America being a country it is, Everybody copied us the following year, and we lost our advantage. But the first year was magical. 
And the guy we got for our little group that were interested in the things that I just said was Paul Steinhardt. Did you, do you know Paul? Uh, Paul Steinhardt went on to be one of the great gurus of the Big Bang. Uh, I don't know where he is now, but anyway, he made a great career out of that. And he, needless to say, uh, building these models, which is what we set him to do, and then measuring them very crudely and thinking about them was very easy for a man like Steinhardt. And I mention this partly because uh, it relates to something I think in the program. Uh, and for, there were several papers published. Fortunately, I'm not on this one. Don't remember why historically, but but there is a paper uh, which is cited today because there's something in it which relates to the property of hyper-uniformity, yeah, which I don't understand. Why I'm not on that paper, I don't know, but there's a connection that's still topical today. Now, time had moved on and computers were getting better and really this, although this was exciting and informative, was a little bit embarrassing as a method of, of proceeding. And so, of course, uh, I moved all over to doing things uh, by computer. And I did this with a, a, another great man called Fred Wooden. I won't tell you the story where Wooden came from. It involves Edward Teller and it's a good story, but no, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm reminded by the Oppenheimer movie the other night. Uh, Fred and I, mainly acting as a dis at a distance between continents, we worked on constructing random networks for amorphous silicon on the computer. Yeah, the model was a little bit crude, so we, we decided to call this computer substance we were making psyllium, as it might be a little silly. Uh, name didn't really catch on, but I think that was a good idea. Uh, because of course it was it was pretty basic, but we did learn a lot from it. I realize now that in analyzing and thinking about that all that, we were engaging on a subject that Bernal was the first to define for people like us. This is what you will be doing research on: statistical geometry. He said that very clearly. It's a new subject that we should all be working on: statistical geometry. And in the case of a more silicon, the statistical geometry is how many five-fold rings do you have, how many six-fold rings, that part of the dihedral angle distribution, things like that. Going back to Bernal's personal life, something I say to my colleague Stefan Utzler is he's not at all celebrated in his native country, um, except there is one Bernal Institute recently put up, but there's no Bernal lecture, there's no Bernal medals, none of that sort of stuff. And this must be because of his communism, uh, because it was a, Ireland was a very right-wing, almost fascist country for most of the 20th century. Not anymore. So he was better off in England, where he was recognized at the highest levels, especially during the war. Like many talented people, and it didn't matter if they were Irish, he, he contributed to the war effort, things like the D-Day landing. And there's a lovely quotation that somebody in the government said, I don't care if he is as red as the fires of hell. We need them, we need this guy. <laughs> Which contrasts rather with Oppenheimer on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, so he worked, he worked for the government. Uh, and he's, he's, he is memorialized in the Royal Society by a Bernal lecture, one of their major lecturers 
lectures, annual lecture. His own Bacarian lecture at the end of his career, not the end of his life because he lived on it in sickness for quite a while. His Bacarian lecture is a, is a very nice summary of what I've been trying to tell you today. And I close what I have to say about Bernal. I have a little bit more to say, but by saying that I'm sad that I never met him somehow with my Cambridge connection and one thing and another, maybe I should have bumped into him. Uh, but he was in Birkbeck College by then. He wasn't in Cambridge anymore. Nevertheless, that's a, that's a personal regret. I just want to say a little bit about one of his research students at Cambridge. Now, I will confess I knew nothing about this woman until I prepared this talk. And conscientiously, I did a bit of research for it, yes? And I popped Helen McGaw, McGaw, a great Ulster Scots, Scots Irish name, uh, from County Antrim originally. Uh, Grew up in Dublin to some extent, I think. And I was very fascinated by Helen. Uh, for one thing, she's extraordinarily similar in appearance, in the nature of her career, to Jocelyn Bell Burnell, whom I know very well. Jocelyn is the one who didn't get the Nobel Prize in Cambridge uh, for discovering the pulsar. She discovered it, but her supervisor got the Nobel Prize. And this is a this is a real cause scenario among our feminist friends. I do have them, uh, and, and you know, long ago I counted Jocelyn's honorary degrees, and she'd had twenty eight at that stage. God knows what it is now. She's been honoured in every particular way, every, every way. And this lady being somewhat similar, I, I it's an interesting analogy. Um, Admittedly, as I told you, uh, our hero did not receive the Nobel Prize. Uh, so there's no argument for giving him the Nobel Prize. Also, her research topic wasn't biophysics, which is what he would have got it for. But she did determine for the first time the structure of perovskite, which is a celebrated crystal structure, standard crystal structure. Uh, and she is celebrated in one way, which I do not understand. An island, I think, in the Pacific is named after her, the Magal Island. I have the time rushing over to greet you to, to, to find out what that's all about. Uh, maybe there's a perovskite mine there. Uh, for some reason, that's it. But I, I'm glad I find this because she is Irish and it, it's another to add to Bernal, it's another interesting case for recognition in, in, in my home country. Uh, and I'll be working on that when I get back. Thank you very much. There's one question. Bernard is not a very Irish name. Is this, I thought it was a French name. Uh, yes, and, uh, the what I've read about that is a bit vague. It is a French name, uh, but it goes back some generations. Uh, it may be a Huguenot yeah. name. A lot of Huguenot names in Ireland. Uh, but the Huguenots, the, were the Huguenots Protestants, I think? Well, if they're not, they were a defined Catholicism. Um, they were just conventional Catholic family, and I don't, I don't think there was much memory of where the Bernal name came from. What was the subject that uh, in biophysics that Bernal would have won the Nobel Prize? Uh, well, there are several things, but sex hormones is one. He determined the structure of sex hormones. You uh, there proteins as well. Uh, something on, on which is still a very fashionable subject today, but apparently they were doing work on, on the crystallography of proteins way back then, and he made some of the first steps on that. I, I mean, I think he was a very good 
technician in the lab inventing new ways of, of, uh, of doing this sort of thing. If my memory is right, in the case of proteins, they were getting very, very poor results. Uh, and then he discovered, partly by accident, that's research, he discovered that if you kept the protein wet, uh, the, the water molecules played some part in keeping it in a tiny crystal structure. And you got much better results. And that was a big breakthrough. Not big enough for the Nobel Prize, but a big breakthrough. But was it clear what he did in the war? Sorry, I don't hear it from all of it. Is it clear what he did in the war? Because well, I, well, I think mainly the D-Day landings. Um, the D-Day landings, I don't know much about this, but there was a feeling uh, in the British government that the this was, uh, and perhaps the Americans, the, that this was an operation like they've never been before. Uh, they, there's, no, there's no precedent uh, for, unless we go back a lot, for the Tudor period or something. There's no precedent for taking a modern army and somehow getting over to France in a hurry. Uh, and there, therefore, a large research project was set up to, in which they studied all the hydrographic uh, tidal information uh, to give a very precise instructions to the military as to what they could could not do uh, in, in landing. So they didn't want to step on the sandbar somewhere. It's common enough in that part of the world. Uh, so that that's largely what it was all about. The, 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 taking the landing sites and characterizing them very clearly and timing it to within minutes as to when people should go ashore. John Jolie, who's a hero of Trinity College in Dublin, he also very similarly was called into that. Apparently he was a, a real nuisance speaker. He was a geologist, major, but very inventive. Yeah, I remember reading that he was a real nuisance because he, he absolutely insisted on understanding all the tides to within a centimeter. Oh. Nobody could believe, and I'm sure they were right, that it mattered to that level of accuracy. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure to what extent this was necessary, but they felt they needed the best brains for this. Well, he was an expert in blue mechanics. Sorry? He was an expert in blue mechanics. Yes. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis.